Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 42 Rugby Weekly. Gavin Casey here, and joining us, as always, to chat about the rugby over the weekend and look tentatively towards the Six Nations now at this point is the 42's own Murray Kinsler. Murray, how are you? Yeah, flying. How are you, Gav? I'm super. Thanks very much. And Bernard Jackman, good to see you. Are you in the mood for Six Nations a couple of weeks out? I'd imagine it kind of hits you when you get your schedule for more to Ebert, does it, that it it's around the corner now? Yeah, I know for sure. I'm just get booking flights and um, trips away. I'm into France, I think, France three times. Um, pitch site for Ireland Wales next week. So, yeah, first day, first weekend into it. But, um, so, yeah, I can't wait. We have a question here, actually, for you off the bat. It came from one of the members, Mick. He said, on last Thursday's pod at 35 minutes and 47 seconds, Birch suggested that Byrne was not a test standard second row when talking about the second row depth chart. So my question that I need to ask him on this week's pod is, what drugs was he smoking when he came up with this opinion? <laughs> <laughs> my my drug dealer has struggled to get to me during COVID. No, I I, I was definitely uh, drug drug free. Look, at, I I understand what he's saying. When when you see Tyke Byrne play for for Munster, um, or even when he plays for Ireland, he obviously can do an incredible job in the in the second row. But I'm not the only person who's doubted whether he's you know, a, a proper test second row. And a lot of people are, uh, have flirted with him as a six um, and as an impact player off the bench in either second row or or, ben, or, or blind side. So I look at it, I know people find it hard to see when they see him making jackals. Why can't he do it? Um, but there's other qualities that people look for in, in test second rows that um, sometimes it's not obvious and some of that's around size and power and, and it's around the scrummaging which is obviously very difficult to to gauge as a, as a spectator or as a pundit but um, as a coach or a scrum coach forwards coach being able to you know get feedback from those around and be able to see the impact a said second row can have on a scrum they can judge that but but look at Tyke, Tyke, Tyke's form has been outstanding and for sure the other areas of his game uh, help him make a very good case to play in the second row, particularly now that Ian Henderson is is just come back from injury. Um, but yeah, I, I, I still stand over it. I'm not 100 percent sure um, that he's he's a starting second row every every week for, at international level. Ah, we're going to get more messages now after you concluded with that. <laughs> I, I wonder what you make of it, Murray, because it strikes me that it might be one of those things where somewhere along the way perception became reality and in that somebody just had the idea that eh, maybe he's not quite conversations begun about that uh the, the idea that he may not be a, a, a test it's not even test standard really is it it's more test size actually kind of what we're talking about and uh, as a lock and um i don't know over the last couple of years i would have thought he, he has sort of dispelled that notion i, I wonder what you think yeah, I think back to that game in 2019 in the Six Nations where Joe Schmidt gave him a big start against Wales away in the second row. And it probably didn't go well for anyone that day. But I, I don't think Schmidt was delighted with what Byrne offered him. Probably in some of those areas that Birch just mentioned that are less obvious to the eye when you're watching the game live. Um, the big moments obviously stand out, jackals. And I think he got one early in that game. But that aside, probably didn't feature prominently even on, on, on that aspect of the game. Um, I'd, I'd agree with you. I think over the last couple of years, he has developed hugely and he's not the biggest, lumpiest second row. That's obvious just looking at him, but he does punch above his weight for me, even in the carry, in the the tackle exchanges around the breakdown, in those narrower, tighter channels. He, he definitely punches above his weight. Like it has been interesting though that, and maybe a little bit telling that, that Ireland, when they've had Henderson and James Ryan available, that's been their, their frontline lock pairing and burn like you know it's baffling to think that as recently as the New Zealand game he was on the bench you know and um that was his impact role obviously for the Lions there was the frustrations of not getting enough test series exposure but obviously Gatlin didn't see exactly what he wanted and viewed him exclusively actually as a as a six really particularly when it came to the test series so yeah there's a lot of good judges of rugby there who maybe have their reservations but for me, the way he's playing and the impact across all areas of the game, I'd have in my starting second row this uh, this opener against Wales in two weekends' time. Yeah, I'm with Mick. We might 
circle back towards Ireland towards the end of the show. Uh, I do have one more question to ask you guys about it as well, but just to let people know what's coming up, we are going to naturally look back on the provinces games over the weekend. Maybe cast one eye towards those last 16 ties, even though a lot can change in terms of personnel, injuries and so on in the interim. But it's just fun to talk about, isn't it, with four provinces into the knockout stages. Uh, And we're going to chat about some of the... Well, we're chatting about the chat coming out of Wales, I suppose, and some of the issues currently surrounding Welsh rugby and how their regions are getting on versus their national team. Uh, There was a sort of a disturbance in the force there during the week that we will get into towards the middle of the show. But, Murray, surprise news yesterday from uh, Andy Farrell's presser. Was it yesterday, Tuesday? I'm not sure. But uh, the fact that Joey Carberry is pretty much fit again when he was included in the squad a lot of people including myself were surprised because I think most fans would have presumed he would have been out a little bit longer with the injury that he did sustain suddenly he's a a couple of days out from uh, returning to full contact training so we had probably established on this podcast and in the Irish rugby community generally speaking that Jack Carty was going to be the the backup to Sexton for this tournament is that suddenly a little bit less certain to your mind if Carberry is back and, and firing? Yeah, it sure is. And I was as surprised as anyone. The update was that Ian Henderson is the only one who's a doubt now for that Wales game. Everyone else, Furlong, um, anyone who had an ish- injury issue, even van der Fleer, they're going to be uh, back in full training, as you say, including Carberry. And, and Farrell's phrase was fit as a fiddle. You know, he said he's been training since um, pretty much straight away after the surgery or the the fracture of the elbow and that he's flying and training and he's been able to do all the skills. It was a pretty positive report um, and just gave you that quick sense that, oh, okay, he's back in the mix here and um, maybe he's going straight back in the match day squad. We had kind of, yeah, as you say, established that Jack Cardi was set to be that backup out half and deservedly so. His form has been so strong. I started getting a few worried messages then yesterday when the, the Carbon News came, like he'll still pick Carty, right, won't he? Um, but I don't think that's a, that's a, a straight choice now. Um, personally, I would pick Carty because I think his consistency of form uh, and the quality of rugby he's playing just cannot be ignored and you've got to reward that. But Carberry has clearly been Ireland's second choice out half for a long, long time. And Andy Farrell will be loath enough to miss chances for him to play off the bench in a Six Nations feature prominently. He covers fullback as well. And we've mentioned before about how it would be fascinating to see him potentially play there a little bit more. So there's reasons to go with Carberry and stick with Carberry. And as we've mentioned before, most recent test form is most recent to, uh, most relative, sorry, relevant to a, a test coach. And um, he's played in the November test. He was part of that. And Farrell want to continue that momentum. But I have to say, I do hope that Carty's excellent form is rewarded. It's a brilliant, brilliant little conundrum, actually, Birch, isn't it? In that you have a guy who is flying uh, for his province in Carty, and yet you have a guy in Carberry who has a little bit of, of test pedigree, as Murray says. He's been back up for so long. He's actually shown up when he's been brought on as well. More often than not, he's, he's done very well, including most recently against New Zealand. He lands a couple of uh, key penalties, particularly that first one. And... I guess it comes down to really, from Farrell's point of view, whether he puts more stock at the moment in the fact that Carberry has that pedigree or the fact that Jack Carty is pretty much red hot. Red hot. Yeah, I would say over the course of Six Nations, if both of them stay fit, it, Carberry will um, will get ahead. But I'd like to hope, same as Murray, for round one, um, that Carty would be get, get the nod because he's match ready. Obviously, Carberry can cover fullback as well. So that that's an added bonus to him when it comes to the selection. But I just think if that hadn't happened to Johnny Sexton after five minutes, it's a it's a long, you know, period for, for Carberry to have to to play. And I know uh Farrell is saying he's fit as a fiddle. Uh we don't know how much contact, return to contact work he's been doing. Obviously he's gone to Portugal. They could have sent him back to Munster to play this weekend if they felt he needed a little bit of game time. So I, I would sense that he's very fit aerobically. Um, but might just need another week, an extra week after Wales. Um, if he gets back into contact prep this week in Port or then this weekend in Portugal, then he'd have two weeks after that before he'd be re- available for round two. So, yeah, personally, I think it'd be a bit risky to throw him straight in on the bench. Um, and I think Carty should get the nod for the first game. And they've taken that risk before with Carberry, like the 2019 World Cup, obviously the prime example of that and it's a very different circumstance everyone wants to be a player who goes to a World Cup 
and Carberry, as far as we know, was pushing hard himself to be included there, but that didn't work out well. So I think, again, like the medical staff are the experts in this area and they'll be really diligent in, in this, but Birch is right. Uh, maybe erring on the side of caution is a, is a good thing when you've got a full championship ahead. I presume that Carberry has been eyeing that Italy match for uh, hopefully for, for a start for Ireland in the number 10 shirt, as will Jack Carty as well. And, and if he gets his chance off the bench, you'd hope that that form continues because then you've got a really nice bit of competition um, in behind Johnny Sexton, who's still the main man. Let's talk, let's talk about Jack Carty's team then and how they got on in Paris over the weekend. Bit of a similar story to the week before and on last week's pod, Birch, you uh, made a, a sort of imp- an impassioned case for why Connacht might be treated as small but differently in the media than the other provinces due to resources due to historical under resourcing really uh, and the discrepancy there at the same time I suppose they won't look at their defeat to Stade Francais through that same lens Andy Friend and his team will be actually disappointed that it's happened and that's, that it's happened again did it go wrong in a similar way to the Leicester game to your mind or, or was there something a little bit different about how they faded that little bit in Paris no it's it's similar but for me it's the same it's the same core reason they they don't have the depth they don't have a bench to br- to bring on um, and it was worse their 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 start or their their selection for Stade Francais was weaker than it was for um, for the Leicester both Leicester games because of injuries and and, and some COVID and you know they're they're Jordan Duggan. Um, had to stay on longer than he normally uh, would have liked. Um, they were very slow to to bring on, you know, change the tight head. Uh, Sam Elo got a couple of minutes at the end. But that's because they're trying to mine those young academy players, Charlie Ward and Sam Elo. It's not, a reflect, it's not a reflection on them. They will be good players. Um, but this is Champions Cup rugby away to home from a, a, a well-resourced, you know, uh, team with a, with, a, with a lot of talent and ability, even though Stad aren't putting it all together at the moment um, to go up against them uh, in crucial scrums in, between minute 60 and a minute 80 was going to be a huge ask and and th- I think that's where the match was the match was lost to be honest and people would say oh yeah but that's every week or regularly now the last quarter are they fit enough do they need to manage the game better no it's bullshit if, if you can't have solidity at set piece um, when you bring on your, your bench or you're afraid to use your bench um, you're going to lose the game, and I think was it six or six five scrum penalties um, was the last was the kind of the last sequence, and one and a mall penalty, um, which came from a, a a kick to touch from a scrum penalty. So it just that was the Achilles heel, and even though with fourteen men, that what didn't matter because Stad were playing ten man rugby at, at the end, and, and rightly so because that was their best chance of winning it. So I think Connacht showed enough with the ball they had um, that they can trouble anybody um, with their attacking game and to score, you know, to get the four try bonus, to get two points out of that. Um, given, you know, where the shortage they had in the front five, I think, I think it's understandable. Look at loads of people are saying, oh, they have an issue. They can't close out games, etc. cetera. I, I do think it's down to just not having enough bodies in that front five. Um, and that costs you, that costs you a lot of money. You know, uh, you put any academy, two academy props from any province or, regional or, or district or premiership team into a, a match situation like that, it was going to be incredibly tough. Is it the case, Murray, that if they had a full complement in their front row and they weren't missing so many through injury that we, we may not even be having this conversation? Or is this an issue that may rear its head again as the season goes on? Because I guess from a Connacht fan's point of view and maybe even from a couple of the players' points of view, it, it, it sort of almost seems a little bit hopeless what we're saying, you know, well, they don't have the depth and therefore this is going to happen. You know what I mean? And sure, Jesus, they might as well just stay at home. So on Saturday, you know, like that doesn't really tally with what we've seen of them probably earlier in the season and over the last few years. Yeah, that's a, a heavy dose of realism from Birch there. Um, and, and that it is going to be an issue. And if you look over the course of seasons in every single sport, you can probably point back to those kind of issues of squad depth and squad quality um, as being the decisive factor, even above coaching genius and tactics and everything. It's often about having the best players, experienced, grizzled pros. However, there's loads of little bits that they have to focus on in terms of a, a kind of week-to-week improvement. Like like you look at this game, they've conceded four pen- 14 penalties. They've turned over the ball a lot. They've 
failed to take restarts. They've obviously had defensive slips to to allow Stade Francais to to rack up thirty seven points. They haven't had enough um, accuracy in in that side of their game, uh, and all those things are going to be important factors that they they focus on and try and improve o- over the course of the next few weeks and months leading up into those Leinster games, which are going to be such a an uphill task against such a brilliant team. Um, so yeah, absolutely. There's those issues in the background that they have to be working on in terms of next season, in terms of recruitment, making sure that they have enough density in their squad. And shorter term, it's brilliant that Dennis Buckley is is going to be back very, very soon. Hopefully this weekend, they've missed him badly uh, and that'll add hugely to their, their depth. But yeah, they were down some good front rows and that was always going to be a, a, a tough task. But I definitely look at other areas as well. Even in attack, they did some brilliant stuff, but their rock ball was often slow. Um, they probably missed chance to pressure Sad Francais in their own kind of territory, particularly after the red card, after what was it, 37 minutes. That was a big opportunity for Connacht. And I think they should be quite self-critical of the actual performance as well as those bigger issues in the background. Is that then how Andy Friend, Peter Wilkinson and Cole will attack this, Bernard? Make sure absolutely everything else is spot on. Make sure everything is is to 100%. And if you can play extremely well for 60 minutes, have a bigger lead than even they did in the fourth quarter. I'm not saying that they presume they're going to keep blowing sort of leads in the last 20 minutes, but just that uh, if your lead is unassailable, it doesn't really matter. And, And make sure if you make sure everything else is pristine, meticulous, maybe it can paper over the cracks of, of a, a lack of depth, so to speak. Yeah, no, no, for sure. There's like I agree that there was areas that they could have done they could have done better. Um and they will be focusing on that. They'll be you know, it was a great relief to them that they qualified before the game because I think, you know, they would have known going over there it was going to be incredibly tough with, with so many uh, front rows out and unavailable. Um but yeah, the rook speed stuff I agree, yeah, it can be quicker, but like you're up against bigger, more powerful men, and uh, there is going to be times when you're going to have to play off, off slow ball. And also, if you play that high tempo, offloading game, you are going to have more errors. It's just the nature of it. Obviously, they're going to want to be better. Um, but I think Buckley coming back is a, is a big uh, boost. When Beelham's there, they're generally uh, secure enough. Robertson McCoy was out. Uh, Matthew Burke has done well this year. So they're, they're all missing, and they will have injuries, but to miss, to miss five... Uh, props who were Angel got injured a week before and he's he's a youngster but he's at least got some experience so I just thought that was they were very very unlucky in terms of where they got the injuries and particularly given the opposition they had but for sure Peter Wilkins and Andy Friend will they can, they, they, they won't be talking about that all in the match review Monday it'll be around the areas that Murray's highlighted um, but yeah if they're going to beat Leinster they need a lot more luck um on the injury COVID front and some of the other provinces who have more depth. Mm. And it's a good, it's a good point about the rock ball. And if you have got bigger, more powerful props, you're going to win a lot more gain line and have quicker rock ball. And it all ties in together. And also yet again, the last couple of weeks have been a reminder that no scrum, no win. Yeah. Well, looking at their last 16 opponents, then Murray and what they were able to put together in Bath, you were over there. Um, Is it fair to say that, Connacht kind of don't have a chance of going through here, and I'm I'm being, I suppose it's it sounds harsh, but if if it was one, le- if I could flesh it out before we get a load of emails, like I feel as though <laughs> if it was one leg in Galway or even in Dublin, you have a shot. But just the fact that it's two legs, I think cripples Connacht here because I think what they would need to produce in Galway, um, maybe uh, uh, it, you, you, it may be impossible to replicate a week later. You know what I mean? It may actually take so much to win even one leg that they they might be a little bit flat the following week, particularly because uh, of the lack of numbers or the lack of depth that we're talking about. Mm, it's going to be a fascinating dynamic, even in the other ties, just how, let's say Connick do get a really brilliant one-off performance in Galway and they get a, a nice little lead. Then suddenly there's pressure there on, on Leinster and absolutely you'd back them to overturn it if that was the case you know, you've got a second chance. But it will be interesting to see how that dynamic works in terms of teams taking a lead and, and what position that puts the the opposition in, how you maybe guard a lead, how you play in the second leg. Um, and I actually actually can't wait for this round. It's been a really frustrating European so, so far, but there's some brilliant battles ahead of us. Um, 
and so tough for, for Connacht because Leinster have looked so excellent in the last couple of weekends. There's definitely concern there, obviously, and many people have pointed out that they're not getting quite the calibre of tests they'd want, but they've gone about it in a really clinical, professional manner. And I still think we're seeing signs of them being very self-aware of what they need to improve. Even something like how they're actually finishing off scores in the 22. And the best example is the Frawley finish. They had a lovely little play there where Henshaw plays that kind of shoulder ball out the back to Johnny Sexton and Jimmy O'Brien swinging late into shape. Then Sexton can either hit Frawley short and flat or go out the back to O'Brien and he hits Frawley and he, and he goes and scores. Now there's penalty advantage playing there, but I like the way they're developing that side of their game. Obviously in the past, they've been very pick and jam orientated close to the try line and they still will be but they're adding little tools to their game in, in that way to show that they're adding strength to their bows as well physically they obviously need a, a big confrontational test because that's been the doubt that we've we've mentioned so they're they're taking along as nicely as we could have predicted after their frustrating period loads of guys in good form individually um, and that bodes well for Ireland and the Six Nations um, certainly from last weekend but I would agree with you it's a huge task for Connacht and from this early viewpoint um, not knowing what the injury situations will be Leinster are the, the heavy favourites there Birch have you seen things from Leinster uh, Murray mentions a couple there that would sort of turn your head a little bit I, I just feel it's unfortunate for them in a sense that they have absolutely blown away these two teams but the team's on those days specifically were so poor and in Bat's case probably routinely are so poor that they're just getting no credit for it and it, and as Murray says it feels as though they're waiting to be tested and yet uh, based on an eye test I feel as though what they've actually put together in those two games has been massively impressive and maybe we're not speaking enough about it. Yeah, but uh, like uh, I think we uh, we obviously can appreciate how good Leinster have been but we also have to look at the quality of the opposition. I mean, if anyone watched Montpellier Exeter last weekend, uh, Montpellier put out a different team, but more importantly, a different attitude and and showed what they could have brought to the RDS and we would have had a real test for Leinster. But like looking at some of the tries Leinster have been scoring, it's not even really good practice for their attack. Uh, like, I know you had a nice piece with Robbie Henshaw, um, you know, and, and that pass for, for Josh van der Fleer. Yeah, and, and it's well put together as well, detailed, but like a normal defence anyway confident in what they are doing won't get breached by that do you know what I mean so in some ways you, Leinster would be better off having to do that to having to run nice plays four or five phases in a row to eventually create a hole uh, it's nearly coming too easy for them and uh, but look at they, their objective was to get 10 points out of those two games they were hurt by the decision by the EPCR and they wanted to to ram it down their throat so it is great to see so many individuals look really sharp and 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 fresh. Um, but I do think Leinster, and this is the challenge that they have had most seasons, is that um, they only rarely get tested three or four times a season. And that doesn't help them improve enough that they can step up and overcome a, a really big hurdle when it, when it comes. And that's that's probably what, what they would have preferred to have, you know, um, at least once uh, in that group stages. But um, I think Connor can, can definitely ask questions of them. Um, and obviously the problem for Leinster a little bit is, and they've generally dealt us pretty well, is just the fact they've lost so many players to Ireland for, for the next block. Um, it's sometimes a race to get that cohesion quickly. Um, again, when when everyone comes back out of international camp, so there's lots of different things that could affect Leinster injuries, etc. But yeah, on form, on form, Leinster for me should win the Champions Cup this year, um, and it's a, it's a phenomenal opportunity. But I do think the reason we're not I'm not going hyped about him is because I, I looked at Montpellier and Bass and went, that's that's way off where you need to be in the Champions Cup, you know. And the thing there is. Let's take La Rochelle as a comparison because they're the most recent side to beat them in Europe. Yeah. Like La Rochelle have been through, what, seven or eight incredibly tough tests in the top 14 already this season. You think at the start of their campaign, they lost several games. They had a really tough run of fixtures against Toulouse, Montpellier when they were really focused, say, Birch. Those kind of high quality, high physicality teams. And that's the... I suppose, benefit of being part of that top 14. It is an absolute battle every single weekend. You go to cast and you're fighting for your lives and La Rochelle came up short there, didn't they? Very recently as well. Another big um, learning thing, learning curve for them, I suppose. And, and Leinster haven't had those 
those challenges. So um, that is going to be the the doubt in the back of your minds. And there's no way to find out now. It, we we got to wait until the latter stages of, of the competition. But you would love to see them play a Montpellier, as you say, in that kind of form or, or um, a La Rochelle right now. Oh, there'll be fun games ahead for sure. And, and and I think that first leg in Galway, whatever about the tie overall, mm. is going to be absolutely ferocious. Uh, I wonder, will Ulster be in the latter stages of the competition? Uh, it, it, people are speaking about Ulster Burnett as contenders. And I think if you look at their pool, uh, as in how they performed in the pool, it's difficult not to. Home and away wins against Clermont. And, you know, any other year, people actually would be raving. But they seem to have actually tempered expectations to a degree. It's kind of like they're just plugging away nicely uh, on the right trajectory and nobody's getting too um, overexcited necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. And um, their front five are, are steadily showing a bit more grit, being more consistent. Uh, I think for Mullen, you know, while he's not maybe making the, the big carries that Katsia did, um, is having influence at the right times, which is what we would have expected. So, um, and then there, you know, the likes of Hume and, and Larry, et cetera, are, are, are flying. So they'll be, they'll be in a really good place. And I think it'll suit Dan that they're just kind of under the radar a little bit. They have a, a, a decent history in, in Europe, um, you know, I, I, particularly at home. And you know, I, I think that they are in a, in a, in a good spot. Um, and I, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't write them off. I, I, I still wonder how they'd handle a massive pack um, or a team like Leinster who just don't give you any ins into into a game. But um, certainly, look, it's been, it's been such a messy group stages. Um, nearly everyone's had a little blip and, you know, it's it's hard to to judge the form too much. But I think I think Ulster, Ulster have have definitely improved and, and com, coming where they were that day where they just didn't come to Viva and didn't perform, I think they've started to build some consistency. Can they beat Toulouse, Murray, over two legs? Hmm. I'd have to lose his favourites there. I, I really would. They've obviously had a frustrating time recently and seems to be rumbling on still uh, their dissatisfaction with EPCR and bringing French sports ministers etc but when they have a full powerful team out they are really formidable obviously some incredible game breakers in the back line uh, in your halfbacks with DuPont and Entomac but a whole lot of beef up front and as Birch mentions that's the the doubt there listen the most encouraging part is that Ulster have pursued their identity even more and that the guys who are have come through into the team have really grasped hold and are, are the drivers now you know this is James Hume's team it's Mike Lowry's team it's Rob Balakun, Nick Timoney Marcus Ray they're the guys who are probably the most consistently impressive performances and even more obviously than the likes of Remuel and I think they're the kind of calming influences in the background even someone like Billy Burns I thought he was brilliant last weekend his range of passing was a joy He's cover defence even for that time where JJ Hanron chips over the top and he's alert and he's aware, but he's facilitating all those brilliant players, um, X Factor players in his team. Uh, and that's the the most encouraging part. They're always a thrill to watch Ulster. And with that thrill is real effectiveness in their attack. They can score um in in a real kind of blink of the eye moment with with some of the fire uh, power they have in, in that back line. And as Burst says, if that front five can really be consistent and get on top of teams or get parity with someone like Toulouse then there's there's no reason not I'd have Toulouse as the favourites in my mind early on but again let's see how it pans out in, in the next couple of months with Six Nations and a lot of guys from Toulouse involved in that Yeah and Birch to follow up on that uh, and, and also something you mentioned a moment ago about teams maybe lacking cohesion off the back of uh, Six Nations. I wonder with Toulouse being at home in the first leg, does that work in Ulster's favour? Just in the sense that if you have Toulouse in full flow in their own ground, it, it, it feels almost like irreparably dangerous. It, it, it might be a little bit too much for anybody, uh, including Leinster potentially. But if they're just finding their feet a little bit and that somehow makes the home leg a little bit closer and also can get away even if with a with a a small margin of defeat then you get back to Belfast say at that point both teams are fully cohesive they're they're back to sort of their flowing best similar to, similarly to Toulouse being a match for anybody in uh in Toulouse Ulster I think could beat anybody in Belfast you know so I just wonder almost chronologically if that works in Ulster's favor potentially yeah no I I think it's a bit 
it's a perfect draw for Ulster. Um, also, I've been speaking to a couple of friends in Toulouse, and you know, there's been a lot of outcry about the EPCR's decision to not let them play against um, was a was a Cardiff, um, and they they genuinely are incredibly upset and furious and um to such an extent that you, you could see them nearly saying look at this this is his competition's a, a joke this year it's not it's not worth winning um even though they're the champions and that not the players won't say that but slightly that could get into their heads and if they underperform at home that first day and don't get a lead you'd really fancy um fancy Ulster so it's it's a it's a messy one for for to lose this year they should, you know they, they would have banked on me in a top four team um, and they are going to lose a lot of players to to Wales or to to the Six Nations or, or key players to Six Nations. So, yeah, I, I think even though I, I agree, Murray, you would still say to lose a slight favour. It's it's certainly not a um uh, a one horse race, and and Ulster could definitely get through that. Sticking with yourself, how do you think Munster and Exeter stack up based on what you saw of Munster, particularly over the weekend against Wasps? Yeah, look, I think um. It was a good performance by Munster. Um, showed more intense attack, um, and and you know got a got a very convincing win. I watched Exeter against Montpellier. Um, they really struggled with Montpellier's power, but yes, you know they still had some some really good moments. They're certainly not as uh, as impressive as they had been over the last couple of years, and that's not just in Europe. That's been in the in the Premiership as well. Um, I think Rob Baxter is just in the middle of having to rebuild that group. Um, yes, you know they have they have a lot of um, you know team spirit. They're they're well coached, and they are a difficult a difficult challenge. Uh, but I do think he's got to rebuild them now. The team that kind of got them there. They've started to be hard, become hard to keep because of salary cap expectations, retirements, um, guys getting picked for international rugby, and it's just become a much more difficult. It's much more distractions for Rob Baxter than there was when they're building this team who were going to put Devon on the map. So, but I no doubt he he will rebuild it. Um, it's just how many stings are left in the in, in them before um before they totally break up and and they will relish the chance to play against Munster um and they'll be a better side than Wasps so that's going to be an interesting one uh for sure but definitely yeah, the last week against Wasps was was more positive from a from a Munster point of view in terms of more balance to their game yeah i think a lot of Munster fans Murray who might have been upset with the type of coverage they were getting uh, probably after the cast game at home in the Champions Cup and then the uh, you had the Connacht defeat and just a, a few performances in a row which felt underwhelming I think they probably felt vindicated by what they saw at the weekend I saw a lot of people and heard a lot of people saying that uh, well actually the intent has always been there they just executed better against Wasps and like to be honest I think that's bollocks you know uh, I think there might have been a, a degree of intent there for sure in, in plenty of games but never to the same extent as we saw against Wasps now it's not to say you always have to play like the bloody barbarians like you know it's horses for courses as well but as we've said on this podcast probably 40 times 50 times it's about actually playing smart and like sometimes to uh just use one out runners and, and keep it tight for an entire game just isn't smart really you know it felt like they got the balance right uh, against wasps and not only that but they did in fairness execute better than when they did look to go wide uh so do you feel as though even if some monster fans don't believe it's a turning point necessarily that it actually is one a little bit well they definitely have momentum on their side now after what was again a very difficult period of their season and some of the underperformance coming out of that was understandable I agree with you I think in the Connick match in particular they there was no real signs of them wanting to play this way and the criticism was completely justified and it was a really poor um, unambitious performance I thought against Cast away they showed a lot more of the intent that we saw bear fruit against Wasps definitely was more accurate what they did and you're right balance is something that we've been flagging all season. You, you know, that's what Munster have needed in their game. And at their be any team at their best has balance, including someone like South Africa, who's based on confrontation. They've got the ability and the accuracy to, to move the ball into space when it's on, kick into space when it's on, or be confrontational when that is the most important thing. The the thing for Munster from this game, like I spoke with Quick Ball earlier on um, with Connick, Munster actually had 80% quick ball in this game. So like, 
80% of their rucks were under three seconds in speed, lightning quick ball. And obviously that makes a, a huge difference. The pack really impressed in this game. And like, there's going to be way tougher challenges ahead, but that was the most encouraging thing for me. I think everyone in the pack, aside from Omahani, had five carries or more. They all passed and offloaded as well. I think Bar Archer, everyone aside from Coombs, who was obviously the top carrier as usual, they were in double figures for for rock arrivals. And there was some really big clear outs there. Actually, Omani was, I think, top of the kind of dominant shots at breakdown charts. So there's really good balance there in your pack. And there's really good go forward there from your pack. I suppose the, the doubt is when they get up against a bigger, stronger pack like Exeter, for example, where it's going to be a real arm wrestle, whether they can d- deliver that. Um, because so much of what you want to do in attack is based on that. And at times against Wasps, Munster were really clever and being really direct. You think of the Conor Murray try to build up to that where the space in those instances was right over or just at the fringe of the ruck and they took it really well. And then at other times the space had opened up out wide on the back of a couple of good carries and they moved it there as well. So it was a nice um, show of kind of vision and decision-making from Munster as well and better balance. That's the the key. It is going to be some arm wrestle against Exeter. You think of those games a couple of seasons ago, it was 10-10, wasn't it? Then 9-7. So potentially we have the lowest scoring aggregate score in, in this round of 16 tie, but it's going to be really enthralling. I think Exeter have dipped some of the massive super powers they had before have kind of faded um, and I think Munster will have a bit of confidence for this one yeah it could be more like a Champions League aggregate score actually that one <laughs> I know you Murray uh, dug into Ben Healy's performance earlier in the week for the 42 members on Rugby Weekly Extra and it's members the 42e if you want to get those Monday pods there'll also be loads and loads of Ireland coverage including uh, post-match pods I believe Murray over the spring give me a nod there if you're still doing those actually Beautiful. Yeah, we'll have loads yes, of stuff coming during Six Nations, newsletters and pods and all sorts. Good time to get involved. Obviously, the WhatsApp group as well, which is always a good place to, to follow mm-hmm. your rugby. Which reminds me, actually, I need to get both of you guys involved in the, in the WhatsApp group's Fantasy Rugby League this year for uh, oh, the Six no. Nations. I think you entered last year, Birch. <laughs> Murray, you bottled it, but uh, we're going to wrangle you into it this time. Anyway, sorry, to, to bring up Ben Healy again uh, before I went off on that tangent, uh, just to get your own thoughts on him, Birch, because... We have seen, I think, only glimpses of what he can do. And and this was probably the best, um, the most sort of complete sample size, if you like, of Ben Healy's ability, I think, that we've seen in a monster shirt. Uh, Just because probably, credit to Graham Rountree and his pack, they got things marching. He had a little bit of space with which to work. He actually had probably that extra split second to make the right decision at key moments. And some of the little glimpses that we have seen of him, he put together a string of them. uh, And certainly in that first half, really impressed. I wonder, like, Uh, Maybe this is a bit too simplistic, but have we actually undersold his ability a little bit? Has he been seen more as just a brilliant kicker of of a ball, a guy with a nuclear right boot? And actually, for all of the talk of Jack Crowley potentially having even more potential than Ben Healy, and we've probably heard that from people at Munster as well, uh, maybe this guy is a force to be reckoned with um, more so than we've given him credit for. Yeah, I I just don't doing a depth chart for, for something for the weekend and he's in that depth chart uh, high like high up uh, in the terms of 10s I think he's developed really well um, and most importantly I think he's got the right mentality to be uh, a, a 10 that you could trust in big Champions Cup games international rugby obviously he's got a, a great boost but I love his I love his confidence, his sense of assurance, um, how he's he's willing to take on responsibility. And I think to have that at his age is is massive. And you can add good coaching will add a lot of the other layers because he's a you know, he's a good athlete. He's he's got a um a, a decent amount of uh of, of speed. He's certainly got lots of lots of size. So I think he can he can add a lot of other layers to it, but what's very difficult to add is that you know, real hard edge match winning mentality, which I really, I really can see growing him, um, and that's that's why for me he's 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 putting his hand up and um and maybe like, you know, I know Kaylee's playing well at fullback, but he could be a genuine uh, contender to start for Munster and and and. Joe or definitely get lots of game time at ten, and Joey maybe to to play elsewhere if if that's the way they want to play. Interesting one, one to keep an eye on. Uh, we did say we'll talk about uh, 
what's going on in Wales, Bert? You're obviously well positioned, uh, given your former role with the Dragons, to dig into this. We've probably touched upon it plenty of times in the pod in the past, but just with Dean Ryan, uh, who's the DOR at the Dragons, and Di Young of, of Cardiff coming out during the week in a piece with Wales Online and, and really calling for change, I suppose, we thought we might as well... Uh, Bring it up again and kind of flesh it out a, a little bit. Murray, I, I, to start with yourself, first and foremost, it felt a little bit refreshing, actually, that two guys at the coalface in Wales came out and spoke about this rather than pundits, fans, uh, journalists speaking about it ad nauseum without necessarily a whole lot of contribution from people directly involved. Yeah, very powerful comments um, on the record from big, important figures in Welsh rugby. Um, and it was funny, like the Six Nations launch was yesterday, as you mentioned. And an, as often, very often in the past, there was chat around the Welsh region's poor form, not going to affect the, the national team at all. And that has been the case completely. And Ireland are well aware of the fact that Welsh players can come into national camp and be different players, essentially, um, and combine together really well. And it was a strength of Warren Gatlin's era. And they'll they'll look to continue that absolutely, but it's just it's baffling to me. You know, I look at some really good international players not being as effective with their regions in any way. Um, and I remember reading Sam Warburton's book, and he was talking about how you know Cardiff rugby meant a lot to him, but it was all Wales, you know. And it feels obviously in Ireland, the, the green jersey is everything, and everything is kind of channeled towards that. But there's obviously a balance here, and there's massive grow and um, emotional energy gone into the provinces as well, as well as obvious success. And uh, not more recently, but, um, you know, Leinster are still the, the dominant force in URC. So this one is a, a mystery to me. And I thought it was interesting that Dean Ryan was asked about, you know, what needs to change? And he said, there's almost too much for me to mention here. I don't want to just mention one or two things. It needs to be a complete review. And that's why in my mind, I'm, you know, it's time to just go, why are the provinces doing well? But maybe that format doesn't work exactly for, for Welsh rugby. Like circumstances are different, even from province to province in Ireland. And maybe in, in terms of structure in Wales, they, they need to have a look at that. But Birch will be the one to give us insight here. I thought it was fascinating, Birch, that they actually felt the need to, to speak up. Look, they've been afraid to speak up because um, effectively criticising the, the hand of Fiji is a, is a dangerous um, uh Thing to thing to do, but I, I think it's come from reaching rock bottom. So uh, they lost eleven out of eleven games played in in Europe, um, and there's also not even though Wales are the Six Nations champions, um, they had a very poor uh, November. Uh, I think a lot of Welsh fans would say. They were pretty fortunate last year with they had three red cards um, in in games against them. That's you know definitely gave them a little bit of momentum, and the regions have just dropped you know dropped off uh, uh, even more even lower level of competitiveness. So I think Dean Ryan and and Dai Young have used this opportunity to to actually speak up and and say look at enough's enough. And I actually I, I sensed this when I was there. I mean. Um, uh, the the national team, international team, and Warren Gatland success, even though it wasn't year on year, they had enough success that the rugby public believed in in Welsh rugby. And and in fairness, there's a huge amount of people in Wales who don't. They actually they support the club game or the uh, village rugby or or, uh, or the domestic game and international rugby. And then there's another cohort who who just support Team Wales. And they'll never go to a club game or never go to a regional game. And then you've got some in the middle um, who are hardcore regional fans. Unfortunately, they're not enough. Um, and they are, they're passionate about their region, but they're they're in a minority. So effectively, if Wales are doing okay, everything is okay in Welsh rugby. And the WRU are happy because the principality is selling out. The sponsorship deals are are healthy for for the national team. And that's funding the the whole the whole shebang. Um it was interesting, Di Young, I think Dean Ryan and Di Young are, and Toby Boot obviously has been away, but they're the two who spoke out, Dean Ryan and, and, and Di Young, because they've been, they've come from outside. Um, obviously, Di is unique in that he came from inside, went to Was, and then he's come he's come back. But like Di Young said uh, that this is the only week he's really talked about regional rugby, yet he would have a press conference every week. Um, and so every week at a press conference, they're asking about, interna is Jared Evans going to be fit for November? Um, you know, is that, how's Ellis Jenkins' injury? You know, et cetera, et cetera. So imagine that. Imagine you're looking after one of the four professional teams and effectively you feel like no one gives a crap, right? Except what you're doing to 
promote into our Welsh players. So yeah, it's about it's about money. It's about a long term plan. Um, it's about I suppose being able to give the game a chance to grow. And I think, um, you know, if if, if the Scarlets got pumped money a couple of years ago and they won a they won a Pro Fourteen, um, the Ospreys when they had money were more than competitive in the in in the in the Rabo and the, and the, the Magnus League. Um, and for Cardiff, in fairness, have won a European Challenge Cup. Uh, traditionally, when, when Peter Thomas was putting money in, they were able to sign likes of Xavier Rush and had Sam Warburton, and Jamie Roberts and, and some good Welsh players along with some very good foreigners. They were more than competitive. I mean, um, they might they weren't winning a huge amount of trophies, but they were very they were, they were much more decent or, or stronger than they are now. So um, it's about money. And, and as I said, I think I've said before in this podcast, the WRU made the decision to use the money they got from private equity to build a hotel, to put in a, a, a stadium walk, to, uh, stadium roof walk, um, so they put the money into into, uh, into capital investments rather than what the regions feel is is the need for for funding for them. Now, but it's also a little bit paradoxical because this week, Scarlets have signed um, Fafita from from Wasps and and given them four hundred grand a year, and a lot of English clubs said we couldn't we couldn't match the Welsh. So um, Cardiff have signed Liam Williams, have signed Toby Falatau. Um, from Bass and they're looking for a big name hooker or a big name lock um, you know we know the Dragons put a very attractive proposal to JJ Hanrahan so it, it's they have they have some money um, and they're willing to spend it but I think it's about understanding what their cash flow is going to look like over the next five years from the WRU and be able to get rid of that debt that they amassed during COVID which is 20 million across the four regions and they have to pay that back. And that's going to be um, a massive weight on their shoulders financially for the next five years. Um, so, yeah, it's there's a lot of issues. But look, at least as we talked about, I, I was at board meetings with WRU and um, as part of my role as, as the Dragons. And there was no real plan. Uh, it was chaotic. Um, so I'm not surprised they've got themselves into trouble because uh, I'll give you an example. So they one day at a meeting, they came in and said, oh, we're getting rid of central contracts which no one this hadn't been flagged and and I was like well on what basis and they don't work and I said have you spoke to New Zealand or Ireland about this and they're there no no but it doesn't work right so they got rid of them they got rid of them overnight and changed the funding model and then I think it's a year and a half two years later they came out and said oh you know the central contract's the way forward um, and now they've gone back to a, a centrally contracted 38 man squad um, so like yeah it's just there's no rhyme or reason to it so I think this this could be the Six Nations that Wales struggle and that will have a massive ramification on on the overall uh, health of, of, of rugby in Wales and maybe the the kick in the bum they need to actually sit down and actually make a strategic plan Nigel Walker came in um, as the new head of performance and, and apparently he was a very popular choice and and but he, he in fairness to him he's he's his first uh, course of action has been the women's game and contracted, um, uh, I think 12, 12 women's players, uh, women's players, and that that's been great. Um, and I think he acted in very quickly and and and, uh, and with a lot of clarity. And and I think the the regions are hoping now that he'll look at the regional game and um, and ho- and they they believe four strongish regions, um, they're certainly stronger than they am, will help Welsh rugby long term. What about that's fascinating about the fan engagement aspect that you've kind of at the start of your answer there. Um, and speaking to some of the Welsh journalists, like in their defense, maybe they're, they're saying like, my readers don't care as much about the regions. I got to ask about Wales, as you've kind of explained. So like, what do you think it is, Birch, that improves that? And even if we've got any Welsh listeners, I'd love them to get in touch with us, um, Murray at 42.e to, to explain this side of it. Because I've been over for Champions yeah, but- Cup games, which I felt are big games and there's no, no one in the stadium. Yeah, it's look, it's, it's, it's going back... Um, it's going back to the whole start of regionalization and people not feeling the regions that they that they designed represented them. Um, and the Scarlets are a little bit different because you know they're very much formed around Clenetley. Um, it's West Wales, but certainly the Dragons and the Blues, you know, were were very very close to each other. The Dragons, effectively, region um, encompassed Newport, who were who were probably the dominant uh, team in that region, but. Ebbervale, uh, Cross Keys, etc. The other feeder teams in the valleys absolutely despised uh, Newport and um, felt that they had always been 
able to steal their best players, for example. So if you're an Ebbervale fan, were you happy to go down into Newport on a Saturday afternoon to watch the Newport Gwent Dragons? No, they weren't. And, you know, that's why the Dragons were, re- were, were rebranded as just the Dragons, thinking that they would get people from the valleys down because there was no Newport in the name. But then they found out that the people, the Newport fans were pissed off that they were left out of the the name and they just went to watch Newport play in the Premiership. Um, but just as, as well as that, and a lot of people always ask me, oh, how can Wales perform so well in international level? Well, they had a, a generational type group, you know what I mean? Alan Wynne jones Ken Owens, Dan Bigger, uh, Toby Faletau, uh, Justin Tipperick, etc., George North, Jonathan Davies. Um, and they, they kept the, the whole show on the road. But also... If you're if you're playing for a team where there's no interest week in week out, and it's not really that important, or there's no level of expectation, there's not a big crowd there, you can kind of just go through the motions to a certain extent. I'm not saying they do, but it's not like must win game, you know, um, huge 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 intensity all week. People in the when you stop to get your petrol are saying, Peter, are you, are you going you know are you going to beat Was this weekend, which would happen in, in Ireland. Um, effectively, they're under the radar, and then they go into and also probably don't have the the facilities, I mean, like the Dragons were sharing, we were sharing our, our, our training facility with like a, a community centre, um, etc. Wales, were, our Cardiff were training out of a, a leisure centre for a while um, for, because because they lost the, the facility in um, in the in the Vale at Glamorgan. So it, it's not really five star, right? Um, and then they go into Wales and they've got the nice kit, Under Armour, was Under Armour now, it's obviously Macron. You're in a best hotel, but the most importantly, everybody's talking about the match. And then you go into Principality, the atmosphere is unbelievable. And you have, you get this emotional level, you know, which gets the best out of you. Whereas the Irish players have to go to that level quite regularly. Ulster players going to Claremont in the European Cup. Ulster players going to Northampton, must win games. They get to that level. So international rugby, okay, it's another level up, but Irish players and French players and English players have to go to the well emotionally 25 times a year. The Welsh players historically have been going to it for the five games in the Six Nations and November or maybe June Tour or a World Cup. So that that plays into it as well. Um, it's the, like they have, they literally have 10 games a year which are absolutely massive, whereas the Irish players generally have knockout stages of of European Cup or or maybe, a, you know, a, a URC finals and semifinals. Do you think, Birch, that... Like I heard Brian O'Driscoll make it, make an interesting point about Johnny Sexton. I think it was during the Montpellier game a couple of weeks ago when Sexton came on and Bod sort of described him as being pretty much only an international player now. And like that some of his uh, action for Leinster is, is kind of only supplementary and that really the entire program just wants him to play for Ireland at this point and Leinster can can pretty much cope without him for the most part. Do you think that with the Welsh international players then that they are pretty much just Welsh international players and and that I guess from if their season is just geared towards doing well for Wales that probably creates a culture then underneath them where the guys who aren't yet internationals are focused solely on playing for Wales if you know what I mean and and that sense of um of having even a kind of a collective drive for your club just I guess doesn't exist you know Yeah absolutely and it's also not that strong sense of identity um like Okay, Cardiff have, got rid, Cardiff have got rid of the Blues, so now it's Cardiff. So um, that's kept a lot of people are happier about that and go back to the history and heritage of Cardiff RFC. Um, but in general, yeah, like the lads here, there's more of a stronger sense of identity. There's more pressure to do well for your province or your club in France than there is in Wales. And like I, I remember Jamie Roberts playing for Cardiff and playing against them. And he he didn't always play to the same level he did um, when he played for for Wales and and but yeah he was still very good but just they, they have been able to pick and choose their their games more you know Liam Williams has, has played I think more games for Wales than he has for the Scarlet since he moved there in 2020 and 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 that's okay for Johnny Sexton because he has earned a right to do that he's his age profile but if you've got guys if you've got 15 or 16 fellas um, doing that and you take them out of regional rugby on a real level in terms of performance level they can't afford to 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 um to have those guys not playing for the more regularly or playing at their best so that is definitely is a, a challenge i think ireland johnny would be the r- very rare rare uh, the exception to the rule in that and i think he, if you had a conversation with him he would argue that's not the case and i and I, I wouldn't like to have that conversation with him and I, and i don't think he does but um it does make sense now that he doesn't have to play every game for leinster 
Yeah, totally. No, as you say, he has earned the right. I think it was a uh, it was a glib observation by Bod. We'll wrap there, boys, uh, and let you get back to your days. Thanks a million, Birch. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Mark. Cheers, Gav. Have a good weekend. You too. And same to everybody at home. Enjoy the URC, which returns. I know we didn't get a chance to look ahead to those games, but Murray will be looking back on them on Monday. Uh, we've got so much rugby coming up. We've got a live event as well next Thursday evening. We'll plug it again next week. Squidge is joining the three of us for a Six Nations preview. Looking forward to that one. And you can join us on it by becoming a member of the 42 at members.the42.e. Uh, until Monday for members and Thursday for non-members, mind yourselves and take it easy.